African leaders are becoming very wise. They are tired of the exploitation by France and other European countries. They have woken up. They've seen that instead of the Western world helping Africa to develop, they've helped Africa to be enslaved the more. And that is why so many governments in Africa are now saying no to France. These are the kicks of a dying horse. And you can see France is dying in many places in the world, not literally, but in terms of losing her political grip, in terms of losing her economic grip. And that is in itself indicative of a system that has too many internal contradictions. It is high time for France to lift its knee off our neck and put an end to this unjust oppression. Centuries of misery, human trafficking, colonization, and neocolonization have caused immeasurable suffering. It's time to put an end to this cycle of oppression. It's high time for France to leave us alone. It's time for France to take a cue from its European neighbors and learn a valuable lesson in independence. Germany is the leading economic power in Europe, significantly surpassing France which is ranked as the third or fourth largest economic power globally. Germany does not exploit any country, any colony. I can mention Italy, I can mention Spain, who had colonies before, but who do not exploit anyone, who do not interfere, who do not impose leaders in their former colonies. On what grounds does France believe it can continue to impose leaders on us and make choices on our behalf? This must come to an end. And the emerging Africa, the African youth, the African elites, and the African diaspora all stand united in saying no, it cannot continue any longer. France's hypocrisy is evident and pervasive in daily life. Let's examine the cases of Mali and Chad as prime examples of this hypocrisy. In Chad, where the constitutional process has been interrupted, France applauded and its president visited to officially consecrate the new king's coronation ceremony. In Mali, where it is not the constitutional process that has been interrupted, but the transition process, France has condemned and even packed up its things to say that it is leaving Mali. That's hypocrisy. It's the double standard. It is the double language that France employs in its dealings with Africa. During our questioning of Mr. Jean-Yves Le Drian regarding the situation in Ivory Coast and France's decision to allow a third term, he provided a clear explanation. He stated that while he accepted the third term for Ouattara, he refuses it for Belarus. He emphasized that France has condemned the situation in Belarus and has actively encouraged the European Union to do the same. Le Drian explains that in Belarus, millions protested, unlike Ivory Coast, where there were no mass demonstrations on the streets. This is how France deals with African issues. Personally, we expect absolutely nothing from France. We desire her to cease meddling in our matters so that the people of Senegal can exercise their freedom of choice rather than being influenced by France's selection of a candidate using the tactics we are aware of. We begin by targeting individuals, adorning them with the Legion of Honor or a similar knightly rank, enlisting them in Masonic lodges and informing them to prepare themselves as they will be next in line. Even the hypothesis that Macky Sall may not succeed, we know who is being prepared by France. This must come to an end. It will not occur in this manner any longer. Let's be clear. We have absolutely nothing against the French people. In France, both political and citizen voices are rising to hold and express the same discourse as the one I'm currently presenting to you. For example, the deputies, such as Mrs. Frédéric Dumas, who regularly speaks on the platform of the Assembly, who regularly writes to the Minister of Foreign Affairs, since she is a member of the Foreign Affairs Committee, to raise this unfair behavior of France towards Africa, hold the same speech as us. The same Mr. Jean-Luc Mélenchon, Jean-Paul Lecoq, André Chassaigne, all deputies, hold the same discourse as us and hundreds and hundreds of other voices. The NGO NGOs, like other non-profit organizations, are doing remarkable work in the same direction. We strongly urge France to listen to the voices that speak to it 
about our plan for a more collaborative, fairer, and sustainable partnership between Africa and France. It is crucial that we work together towards a future that is equitable, just, and environmentally conscious. If she listens, I believe we'll have beautiful days ahead in our collaboration together. If he doesn't know how to cut it, thinking he can continue to function like in the time of our grandfathers, this African youth no longer accepts it. France must make preparations for a definitive break and completely withdraw from Africa. Africa belongs to Africans, not France. She belongs to no one else, neither China, nor the United States, nor anyone else. Remember, in many African countries, the ballot has been abused to the detriment of the people, and the people are yearning for genuine change that will liberate them from the external colonizers and even the internal colonizers who are latter-day politicians who are using state resources to remain in power and to do the bidding of foreign powers. These are the kicks of a dying horse. And you can see France is dying in many places in the world, not literally, but in terms of losing her political grip, in terms of losing her economic grip. And that is in itself indicative of a system that has too many internal contradictions. And those contradictions are beginning to undermine their confidence. These are former colonizers that are losing their grip. We are going to make sure that they are defeated. The story of Congo is the story of sadness because one remembers that in the 1950s when Congo was still under the control of Belgium, the Belgians never intended to leave. And I read fondly in history when in 1958 the first Prime Minister of Congo, Patrice Emery Lumumba, was invited by Kwame Nkrumah to attend a conference in Accra. That invitation to Lumumba was never meant to take place. In fact, the person who had been invited was Joseph Kasavubu who was to become the first president. And when they came back, Lumumba had now had a dalliance with other leaders such as Nkomo, such as Nkrumah and others, and he came back. And the agitation for independence started in earnest. So that when the Belgians decided to grant independence to Congo, it was in a style that was designed to ensure that it failed. And King Baudouin, who was the king of Belgium at that time, was disgusted on that day when Lumumba gave his famous speech that the history of the Congolese will be written by the Congolese themselves. And barely one year, nine months almost, after the independence had been granted, we saw what started to happen. What started to happen is they sowed the seeds of discord between Lumumba and Kasavubu. At that time, they had already recruited Joseph Desiree Mobutu to be an agent of the Belgians, and history now confirms that he was an agent of the CIA. They accused Lumumba of being a communist, and they even sowed the seeds of secession in Katanga and even in Kivu, and of course we know that Lumumba was arrested and ultimately executed. And the structure was designed in such a way that Congo would never be united 
because the resources in Congo are so much that nobody wants a united and orderly Congo. They want a Congo that is in disarray so that they can continue to exploit the resources of Congo. And we saw that during the kleptocratic regime of Mobutu Sese Seko, that is exactly what happened. And even when Kabila came in, the two Kabilas, nothing might change. So Congo remains uh, a scar on the conscience of Africa because she is so well endowed with resources, yet our poor people remain poor because external forces continue to control Congo. In fact, there is evidence to suggest that one of the busiest air spaces in the continent of Africa is Eastern Congo. They are mining Colton, they are mining cobalt, they are mining diamond, they are mining gold, they are mining rare earth, and their latter-day entrance is not just the European powers, the Chinese are now there. The Americans have always been there since the 1940s, the 50s, and the Belgians are there, the French are there, and other independent miners, and Congo is therefore a complex environment, and that complexity has seen one of the major wars, what was described at that time as Africa's world war when many forces from Africa came and of course there was a lull and then that disappeared and we have seen once again that the forces of destruction and division are back again in Congo and Congo is not at ease. One need only read the writings on this history in the famous works of Kwame Nkrumah, Challenge of the Congo, and you will understand that Congo is a country that is on the jaws of a danger. Complex conflict. Complex because there are external players, external players who now know or believe and of the strong conviction that a disorderly Congo is good. Because if you have conflict, and it's estimated that there are over 120 armed groups in Eastern Congo only, that tells you how complex it is. And these armed groups are financing the activities through illegal mining. It also must be understood that Congo, like most African countries, are victims of the arbitrary boundaries that were created in Berlin. People never remember this as often, that they, as, the, as, often as they should. But the conference, the conference that was held in Berlin in 1884 and 1885 was actually known as the Congo Conference. It was at the behest of King Leopold of the Belgians to deal with the question of Congo. Uh, and, and that is how the petition then came about in order to give people spheres of influence so that the European powers would not fight one another as they extracted things from uh, the Congolese people. Now, why do I say it is complex? And why do I say that the boundaries are also part of the problem? Because of the arbitrariness with which the boundaries were drawn, you now find different ethnicities across borders. Take, for example, Rwanda and Urundi, what was known as Rwanda and Urundi. You find people who were described as Tutsis and Hutus. And you find also a large population of the Hutu or Tutsis, sometimes referred to as the Banyamulenge, who are in Congo, so that they are Congolese. They are, not, they are not Rwandese on the basis of the boundaries that we have. Nyerere, the former president of Tanzania, actually during the early days in 1970, when he was asked to mediate, said, when we talk about the Tutsi in Congo, they are not Rwandese. They are Congolese, according to the boundaries that we inherited. And for that reason, it is incumbent upon the governments and administrations in Congo to treat them as Congolese. France is losing in Africa. France is losing its grip. Even the democratically elected leaders in Africa are now saying no 
to France. Enough of your exploitation. Recently, there have been a lot of coup d'etat going on in Africa. The African nations are revolting over the exploitation of France. And today, even a democratically elected leader of Senegal is saying no more for France. France has got no space in Senegal. So it all boils down to the selfishness of France. France has been exploiting many African countries without giving these countries the opportunities to also be established. So guys, this is what is happening. Let me know what you think about this in the comment section below. Please don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on the notification bell. Thank you.